Matthew 13, and we continue looking at the parables in which Jesus describes for us what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's the kingdom of heaven in Matthew. Uh, if you're following along or examining the parallel passages, the other synoptic gospel tellings of some of these, in Luke it may be, you may find the kingdom of God. They're one and the same. It's just the author with a slightly different focus. And audience, Matthew, of course, writing to a predominantly Jewish audience, uh, would talk about the kingdom of heaven, that is the kingdom ruled over by Messiah and peopled by uh, Messiah's chosen ones. Luke writing for really more of a Gentile, but we could say a mixed audience of Jew and Gentile would use a phrase like the kingdom of God. It's, uh, it's not a biblical error. I have spent a great deal of energy this week talking about the inerrancy and authority of scripture uh, online. It's, it's shocking to me, just sadly, heartbreakingly shocking, the number of self-proclaimed Christians who do not believe that the Bible is without error, uh, who believe that their interpretation overrides and is more authoritative than the words on the page. And yet, here it is. So we have the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. They are really one in the same. But here in Matthew, we're focusing on what is the kingdom of heaven like? And this is important for us because as New Testament Christians, as today in Ajax and contemporary Canada, as will be in the future, as always has been since that passage we just read in Acts, we are ambassadors for this kingdom. We represent Christ. We are citizens in it. We have rights, we have privileges, and we have responsibilities, just like any citizen in any earthly kingdom would. And yet the kingdom is not of this world. Jesus told Pilate that. It is most decidedly not of this world, and he is not a king like any worldly king. So we come to these parables, working our way through them, with this supposition and this starting argument that the better we understand for ourselves what the kingdom of heaven is like, the better ambassadors for it we will be, the better citizens in it we will be. We will understand our rights, we will appreciate all the more our privileges, and we will undertake the tasks given to us in a more faithful and exuberant manner. So we have already examined, and I hope maybe you're, if you've got a little notebook or something, I, I hope that you're making a list, compiling a list for yourself, just maybe even bullet points, what so far we have discerned and been taught that the kingdom of heaven is like. I'll give you a brief reminder. The kingdom of heaven is given. It is given. And it is only given to the elect. It is given to those whom the Spirit of God has begun the work of regeneration on, that is, has de-weeded, de-stoned, given them a new heart in which the seed of the gospel can not only find purchase, but put down roots and come to maturity. That's the parable of the soils. It's always called the parable of the sower, although there, there was, I will remind you, a lesson for the sower. The sower sows the seed. It doesn't alter the sowing technique, and he certainly doesn't muck about with the seed, but... The fact is that the kingdom is given, and it's not given to everyone, but it is given to those upon whom God has chosen and upon whom his favor rests, those whom he has born again, to borrow from John. It's a very important language from John 3. Jesus tells Nicodemus, if you recall, unless a man is born again, and I could take you into the Greek language, that's born again really from above. It's not, we don't birth ourselves, but unless a man is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of heaven, let alone enter it. So we cast the seed far and wide, and we leave the planting up to God. The kingdom is given. The kingdom is a mystery, no longer it's not a mystery as in something that we need to deduce or something that we will never truly understand. That is, like a, again, an, an attitude that, that is in, rife in this age, what, what um, one theologian has called the, the hermeneutic of humility. You, you may run into this. Well, how can we know what the Bible says? I'm just a limited little person. Uh, it's so beyond me, right? We can never really know. That is an absolute lie. An absolute lie. God's word is crystal clear from beginning to end. It says what it means. It means what it says. If, 
and as Charles Spurgeon said, this just comes to mind, not everything in here is given for our comfort. So, it is a mystery then in terms of this. It once was unknown, but is now made clear. That's the biblical word of mystery. That is, when Old Testament prophets were looking forward to the coming of Messiah and the kingdom that he would bring, when, he, they, when they were writing their prophecy, Peter reminds us that they wrote, and then they looked at what they had written, not understanding it, because it hadn't happened yet. Well, here, at the beginning of his explanation of the parable and why he's using them, at Matthew 13, 11, Jesus says, To you, that is, those who have come out of the crowd, for further instruction to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. You may have the word mystery or mysteries. It's clear now. It wasn't before Christ. As New Testament Christians living in the age of the church, the kingdom is given. The kingdom is no longer a mystery. And as we began to look at last week with the parable of the tares and the wheat, there is another reality of the kingdom that we need to be very aware of, a fundamental reality, and, and that is until Christ comes and unleashes his angelic reapers, that the kingdom and the people who comprise the kingdom will share shoulder space. I have to practice saying that. They will share shoulder space with the unsaved. And this is a good reminder, lest we become like the sons of thunder, constantly saying, Lord, will you, do you want us to call down fire from out of heaven on these people who don't believe and act wickedly? He says, no, it's not your purview or your task. You are not remotely qualified to start pulling weeds because, frankly, you don't know which of the weeds I have ordained at some point in their life will actually come to me and become made new wheat. So we don't pull, although... We also look forward, again, we, this is another reality of the kingdom, is that it is both now and yet to come. There is a, a, a very real sense in which we are living in the kingdom age now, but that it is not yet consummated to bring that, that image of a wedding in. We're, we're engaged, but we're waiting for the bridegroom to come, and it, it will be the final act. Again, we, we share the stage with the tares, but not forever. That a day will come, the consummation will come, the Lord will come, the reapers will come, and then the wheat will be separated from the tares, the people of God will be brought into the kingdom forever and ever, directly into the presence of the Almighty, and we will not be afraid and we will not die because we will be made new and there will be no sin, but that will not be for everyone. The tares are bundled together and they are thrown out and they are burned they are burned because they are useless and poisonous and unregenerate. Now those we looked at last week and the week before are the two parables that we specifically have Jesus giving the parable and then explaining the parable. And I have put forth that I believe that this is because they are foundational. They're foundational for the ministry of the disciples going forward. That as they go out and preach the good news, as the 70 go out and proclaim that Messiah has come, that they're going to find all kinds of soils. Don't worry about it. Just cast the seed. And they're going to find that as they make their way through even their own families, that there are a lot of tares sharing the field that is the world. Don't worry about that either. They will be taken care of and not by you. Basically, in this first chapter, laying down the principles of the kingdom of heaven and what it is like, Jesus takes an awful lot of time to reassure his disciples. And here we come now, at verse 31, 32, and 33, to two very, very short little parables that do the exact same thing. They reassure the disciples here in the context, in the place and the time of their telling, but they also contain a very important truth, actually a pair of truths that we're going to look at. Here's the text. He put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. And if you happen to go and look at the Luke account of that, you will see that 
Luke specifically makes sure that the woman adding the leaven works it all the way through the rest of the flour or the dough. So this morning we're going to spend a few moments looking at the mustard seed and the leaven. And if you happen to have the title there, um, one of the things about being pastor here and having to put this together, the program together on a Tuesday, it has forced me to come up with titles, which I was never very good at. But if I had to title it this morning, and, and I had to title it this morning, we are a, this is a kingdom of growth and effect. A kingdom of growth and effect. Because Jesus here is reassuring his disciples it will grow and it will have effect. Because at this moment... They're not sure that it's going to have either of those two things. Remember, Jesus has preached to a crowd. He has presented them the first of the parables. And this is really where the judgment and the separation begins. Prior to this chapter in his ministry, Jesus has done, he's, he's played the field wide, we could say. It has been reminders from scriptures. It has been sermons. It has been proclamations, descriptors about himself, punctuated and authenticated with miraculous works. But now... We come to the parables. There is a definite shift in Christ's ministry. Why is that? Well, the parables, as we have already looked at, are given to start separating those who will not believe from those who will believe. Because you can only really discern the underlying truth of the parable with the help of the Spirit. Which means that believers get it. Unbelievers don't. When an unbeliever hears a parable, Jesus tells them, tells the disciples, it just lands in their ears like a riddle. Or they may take it and they, they take the, the metaphor and they twist it in all manner of means. And it, they make it mean what they want it to mean or they, they bend it so far out of shape that it is far removed, unrecognizable from what it's supposed to be like. But those whom the Lord gives that regenerate heart, those whom God grants ears to hear, they hear the parable. And there's no mystery in it. They understand it. It's made clear to them. So he's saying to the disciples, don't worry about the crowd out there who don't get it. Well, we're here in this house, and it's maybe just you and me and a few others. That's that's worried the disciples. They want the kingdom to come. This is why we read, spoiler alert, this is why we went to that passage in Acts. They still, even after the crucifixion, after the resurrection... After 40 days of Jesus opening the scriptures and their minds so that they understood all the various and minute ways throughout the Old Testament that he fulfilled. What do they say at Acts 1? Are you now going to establish the kingdom? (laughs) That is the earthly kingdom, which is what the Jews wanted. This is so important for our understanding of kingdom and Messiah. What was it that the Jews in this period were looking for? What is it they still look for? They're looking for a a king, yes, a king out of the line of David, yes, Jesus continues to check boxes, but they uh, this this king would also be divinely empowered by God to achieve miraculous works, would act as priest, yes, But it would establish this Messiah, this kingly figure, would establish an earthly kingdom. It would be God's kingdom on earth, but still an earthly kingdom. And Messiah would defeat earthly enemies. Something that the Jewish people have been looking forward to for centuries. Even after they came back out of exile, had the temple rebuilt, and the land given back to their control, they're still serving foreign kings. Flash forward four centuries, we're still serving foreign kings. It's just Caesar instead of Cyrus. And go out into the streets and the marketplace and walk the highways, and what do you see? The soldiers of Rome. When will Messiah come? With the sword of God. And cleanse the land. That's what they were looking for. That's what they were looking for. Now, in a sense, Messiah did come and establish a kingdom, but it wasn't the kind of kingdom they were looking for. And they could never get out of this paradigm that they were locked into they had blinders on that only the ones that God had revealed the truth to could see oh we're not talking about an earthly kingdom at least not yet we're talking about a spiritual kingdom and after the crucifixion it became apparent to at least 120 at least 120 
that Messiah did indeed come to defeat our worst enemies, but that our worst enemies were never the Romans. Our worst enemies were never the Babylonians. The worst enemies that any man or woman will ever face are sin and death, and Christ has defeated both of them decisively. Amen. You see now that the kingdom is not of this world because the king is not of this world. And the way in which he enacts his kingdom is beyond all of our petty human preconceptions of what a king should be, what a king should do, and what a kingdom should be like. And this is what the disciples were worried about. There's a big crowd out there. They don't get it. We're in here with Jesus, we believe, but why are there so few of us? Is this what the kingdom is going to be like? It's just going to be a small group study in the basement? So Jesus says these two parables. He says, it seems that way now, I will grant you. But huge things can come from very small beginnings. Consider the mustard seed. Consider leaven. Now, every farming man who happened to be in this group knew about mustard. Through my research, it's probably something called black mustard. It's uh, still grown in the Middle East today. And if you've ever seen mustard seeds, if you've ever bought, you know, to crush or prepare your own mustard, um, they are really, really tiny. They, they are smaller than, than ball bearings. And yet, apparently from them can grow shrubs. It's not a tree, but it is a shrub. It's, uh, we have descriptions that it is higher than a man seated on a horse, which would put it somewhere, some of them in the 8 to 10 feet just an enormous shrubbery, the largest of all the herbs, and it comes from this little tiny seed. Now, I considered this week, not many of us have probably seen, handled, planted, or grown mustard. Correct me if I'm wrong. So this is an image that's maybe a little more difficult for us to grasp. But how about this? Do you know about the giant redwoods in California? Right? There's ones on the coast, but they're redwoods, and they're pretty big. But then there's actually ones inland in the foothills of the mountains in California, and they are the giant redwood sequoias. They're the ones that are so big, maybe you've seen pictures, where back in the 20s everyone thought it would be a great idea to put a road through a tree. And the tree is actually wide enough that they could carve an arch out of the middle of the tree and drive a car through it. Enormous trees. And some of them are more than two millennia old. In fact, some of them, it's believed, according to botanists, could live as long as 3,500 years. I wondered, what kind of seed does a giant redwood come from? Well, they have pine cones, and they, the pine cones look good, but within the pine cone are little tiny flakes that look like something I would find in my cereal bowl. From a little tiny seed like that comes a giant sequoia redwood. And it amazes me to think that at the very moment in history, when Jesus is telling the disciples that about the seed, the mustard seed, don't worry, mustard seed gives birth, will eventually germinate this huge thing. Don't worry, leaven is even smaller. It eventually works its way through the hole. It, that while he was telling that, somewhere half a world away in California, a tiny little flake of a seed was falling into California soil. And from that seed, a redwood that I could go and look at today began to grow. It's amazing. So if that image helps, it wouldn't have, made any, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have worked with the disciples. They had no idea what a California redwood is. But you do. Same idea. It's a reassurance from Christ that great things can come and indeed will come, I promise you, out of small beginnings. So we call this a kingdom of growth guaranteed growth, and effect. This will be the leaven portion. The leaven, if you've ever made bread, and this is how women in the first century Palestine would make bread, you'd make, a, you'd make a batch of bread, and you'd work the leaven through until you have a great big thing of yeast. And incidentally, the amount of flour here, that uh, three measures of flour, is a ridiculous amount of bread. This would have been enough, this would make bread for about 100 people, enough to feed a village which indeed sometimes did happen. Sometimes there would be a communal oven, and all the women would prepare, uh, prepare their, their, uh, the dough, and then they would all go in, and one at a time, they'd take turns either at the oven, or, or they would hand the dough over, and there would be one or two women who, that would be their job for the whole day, would just bake bread. Jesus is saying that, that the kingdom of heaven will eventually work its way through, and it will actually end up feeding a multitude 
So the disciples needed this reminder because looking around the room, this sure didn't look like, like good foreshadowing for the kingdom of heaven. But history, and in fact the, the biblical chronicle as well as history, proves Jesus correct. No surprise. Uh, I'll give you a sweeping overview of the book of Acts, that from this small seed, we could say the 120 that are gathered in the upper room at Acts 2, moments before Pentecost, by the end of that day, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes, Peter goes out, preaches the second greatest sermon in the Bible. I give the top slot to the Sermon on the Mount. Peter goes out, preaches, and what happens? 3,000 souls are added to the church. Wow, what a leap. We went from 120 to 31, 20, and more and more. And as you read the book of Acts, there's not actually only one additional instance where they bother to take numbers. Beyond that, it's too many to count. This thing is growing so rapidly and so widely. That's Acts 2.41, if you're interested. That's where the 3,000 are added. At Acts 6, one quote, the disciples were increasing in number. Close quote. We, we, there's too many to count now. At Acts 8, this is Philip. Oh, and look what's happened. Now the Sumerians believe. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. It gets bigger and bigger. The ripples go farther and farther out. The metaphoric mustard bush grows, 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 and it all began with this very tiny seed. And then, Acts 8, Samaritans believe they received the Spirit. We also, in that same chapter, have the Ethiopian eunuch, remember him, on his way, reading from the scroll of Isaiah, and Philip is somehow sent into his path, explains it, baptizes him. Good Baptist, here is some water. Baptized and goes on his way rejoicing. Well, history bears this out that he must have gone back to Ethiopia because Ethiopia, that country in Africa, becomes one of the first regions in the world to fully adopt Christianity as a state religion. That's sometime in the 300s, the 4th century. And during the 600s and beyond when Islam swept across and conquered so much of the Middle East and Africa, Ethiopia remained alone, Christian, the only portion of Africa to withstand the expansion of Islam. At Acts 11:19, we have believers scattered in Phoenicia and on the island of Cyprus and at Antioch and in Acts 16 during one of the missionary journeys, we now have a very important event. This is team ministry team Paul in Philippi. You know what's so important about this? He's in Europe. He's in Europe. We're now on an entirely different continent planting the church and bringing the gospel. We're not, we are now in that all the world movement that Jesus told us would happen. And the other thing about Philippi is that we are now beyond the Jewish world. We're now talking to Gentiles. We're in Roman territory, predominantly Roman territory, and we're making believers like the jailer and Lydia and very possibly that, uh, that woman afflicted by an evil spirit. Acts 17, the gospel is in Athens, the heart of Greek paganism and philosophy and self-worship. Paul is at the Areopagus proclaiming the gospel. And at verse 34, some believed. We have believers in the heart of Greece now. Then he goes on to Macedonia. At Acts 25, we have Festus. This is Paul before the Roman governor, and he says, To Caesar you have appealed. To Caesar you shall go. Mark this. The gospel's going to go not only into the Roman world, but right before the seat of Rome itself. Paul, claiming his right as a Roman citizen, says, I demand to have my case heard before Caesar himself. And that's what starts the final part of Acts as they head towards Rome. As Acts concludes, Paul is under house arrest, waiting on, I guess, a long two-year waiting list, at least, to go and see Caesar. Now, we're not told what happened when he got before Caesar, but you can guarantee, Paul being Paul, that in the explaining of his case, he made sure to mention Jesus is the Messiah, and that salvation is available, yes, even to the godless, pagan, wicked emperor of Rome. You see now, history has borne 
Jesus out. The biblical narrative has borne him out. What started as a tiny seed in an upper room has now reached the seat of power in the ancient world and going beyond. We have church tradition of, say, the St. Thomas Christians in India with Thomas going there. We have Christians as far as India. Throughout the 15 and 1600s, Christianity then comes to North America, an entirely different continent that disciples could never have pictured. Across the sea, 1642, we have the first mission station on an island called Mount Royal or Montreal. Now we have the church in Canada. And I'm reminded of that line from Julius Caesar about nations yet unborn, languages yet unheard. First Baptist in Canada, by the way, just to get the Baptist in here, our history. 1760s in the Atlantic coast, the first officially recorded church was at Wolfville, Nova Scotia in October of 1778. More than 1,700 years after Jesus said that the mustard plant is born from a tiny seed and that leaven leavens the whole loaf. There's a Baptist Christ-honoring, worshiping church on the Atlantic coast of Canada. It grew. It grew beyond their wildest dreams. And it continues to grow. So history and the biblical narrative bear this out. Absolutely. The church starts small and grows to today encompass the entire globe. And not only that, that's really in terms of mustard seed nests, but in terms of leaven, now we're talking maybe not so much about physical growth, but we're talking about, and I want to be very careful with my language here and avoid the word influence, because I don't care for the word influence. I'll probably still end up inadvertently using it, but let me tell you why. I have struggled to find uh, another word, and the word is effect. Influence to our ears would be more uh, an aspect of us calling the shots. Those who have influence get to dictate direction, if that makes sense, at least in my mind, and that's not us. Uh, it's certainly not us now. It may have been us in previous decades, indeed previous centuries, where the church had great influence in that we were able to influence the general way in which the populace thought and acted, behaved, even governed. That is simply not true anymore. Influence waxes and wanes, I wrote here, but effect and, here's a better word, power, power from on high, never does so. It never waxes it never wanes because it is not subject to the blowing winds of doctrine or the changing attitudes of the world. It is constant. So I, I am doing my best to avoid the word influence, but that's the other metaphor that Jesus is saying. He's saying, don't worry, it starts small, but it will physically grow. It will grow to something so large that the birds will come and nest in it. This is a bit of a, a harking back to Daniel, and uh, I believe it's Ezekiel, talking about the kingdom of God in its fullness. The birds are foreign nations. Foreign nations will actually come into the kingdom willingly. They will come seeking shelter, and they will find shelter, and they will find sustenance. He's saying it will physically grow, but it, there, there will also be um, a hidden note in your text here. Note the difference between these two things. The kingdom of Heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed. It's very intentional language. It's very intentional, very physical. Compare that to verse 33. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid. Hid. Buries. Stuffs. It's, it's almost surreptitious. It's, it's a process that is as definite as the growing as the mustard bush, but it goes almost unseen. Yet its power is still the same. And this, again, history has borne out. Not our influence, but our effect. The effect of the church. The effect of those emulating Christ. And the effect of the truth and authority, let me say it again, of God's word. Do you enjoy universal health care? Present crises aside. But do, do you enjoy being able to go to a hospital? Thank the church. Go back two millennia, if you got sick, you were on your own. There was no social welfare state. In fact, we have a very interesting letter written around the uh, oh, second or third century of a Roman governor complaining to his superior uh, that 
temple offerings are down. Why? Well, if you were sick, you went to the temple and you put your money in and the priest let the snakes, for example, writhe over you and take away your disease or something. But these Christians are out here and they're doing it for free. Can you do something, please, about these Christians? They're caring for the people and not charging money. And as a result, everybody's going to the Christians, the hospitals, from which we would get a word like hospitality. They're opening their homes and they're caring for the sick and the poor. We can't have this. It's impacting the bottom line. Silly Christians. How about the abolition of slavery? You like that? William Wilberforce sure did. In fact, Article 4 of the United Nations Charter might as well be torn right out of the pages of Scripture. And it's not that we have copied them. It's that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, throughout the vast sweep of history has, yeah, I almost used the word influenced, but its effect has been felt beyond itself. It is working its way through the whole mass of dough, of flour. It's like salt. This is the salt portion. If the mustard seed is the light, it's very intentional, it's very physical, it's unignorable. This is the salt portion. This is the unseen flavoring that nevertheless works its way through. The establishment of our sexual norms, our concept of marriage, our laws, our art, our literacy. When I started researching the impact of Christianity on Western civilization, it goes on and on and on. Everything since the fall of Rome, in fact, literacy itself is preserved thanks to Christian monastics after Rome falls. Do you enjoy the written word? Do you enjoy having books? That was us. Now, there was a time when that would have been fully acknowledged. And that time has long since passed, and that's why I want to avoid the word influence. We don't have that influence anymore. And I actually think that's a good thing because it made us, made us fat. I found this quote from uh, I.E. Core, quote, Husbands, love your wives, commanded St. Paul the Apostle, and that was a new idea in a pagan world where husbands weren't expected to do that. Helping the less fortunate, even strangers, again, Christians were the one who started that. Government that must respect individual rights and conscience, again, a Christian idea new in the world. So much of what we consider to be human decency is, really, the working of Christian faith and morals into world history. Close quote. That's leaven. That's leaven. What you would take, as I started to say, you would, take your, you would make your bread, but you'd keep a little bit left over for next time. Next time, you're making the fresh batch, you have all your ingredients, you take that little bit of leaven that you've saved, unwrap it, and you put it in the rest of your ingredients and you start kneading the dough like my grandmother, no bread makers, no machines. You start kneading this enormous thing of dough and something happens, that yeast starts multiplying and even though you started with this little tiny lump of old dough, it works its way entirely through the new until the new is utterly transformed. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. And that's really what the world is like when the citizens in the kingdom are doing their job as ambassadors. You are salt of the earth. We are also the leaven in the lump. Now, it's interesting that almost every other time you come across this notion of leaven in the Bible, it's in a negative sense. Yes, Jesus is always reminding the disciples, beware the leaven of the Pharisees which is to say their teaching and their hypocrisy. Leaven in Jewish thought is almost always used in an evil connotation. At same reason, a little bit of evil gets in, it works its way through the whole lump. So you must be always vigilant. But here, here is, it's not evil at all. It's being used as a word picture. This is how the kingdom will grow, one of the ways in which the kingdom will demonstrate its effectiveness. Indeed, the current attitude in our world is to remove the debt owed to the Christian faith entirely and then think about Western civilization in terms of our own achievements, man's own achievements, especially over these last several decades. This would be the humanistic movement where we established our morals. We established our priorities. 
They were invented by us. But historically, the church grew. It grew physically from small beginnings like the mustard seed does, and its effect in shaping our very civilization has been like leaven working its way through the whole lump. This is all to say that Jesus' parables are not stories. They're not stories. They are propositions. They are truth statements. You either believe this or you don't. You either get it or you don't. Now, did the disciples understand it? Yes. I believe they did because they didn't ask for further explanation on this one. Did they understand and accept it? Mm, that might be a little bit up for debate, given that by Acts 1, they're still asking, are you going to establish the kingdom? But of all of Jesus' parables, we can distill them down, ultimately, to a single truth. Beneath the word pictures and the relatable metaphors is something called a proposition. It is a statement, and it's true, and you're either on board or you're not. It's something offered for your consideration or acceptance. And this morning, Jesus offers us this proposition. Great things will start and come from small, almost invisible beginnings. Well, that's great, Braden. Uh, what does that have to do for us here in Ajax or wherever our home church may be, in our work, in our families? This was actually the hardest part of this message for me this week, was considering, and I owe a debt of gratitude, I, I want to make sure to Oliver uh, and Arthur, who were downstairs working, uh, and were good enough to entertain me as I just literally walked around the building distilling this and mumbling to myself. They were good enough. I ran into them, and they were a sounding board for me. And I'm sure Holly appreciates that, because she's usually my sounding board when I come into the living room and just start going out of what. Then I see her eyes glaze over, and I know it's time to move on. But I really struggled with this. It's, it, it wasn't the brevity of the passage. It wasn't the fact that we're only looking at three verses. It was, I understand the truth, and I can see it in the sweep of the biblical story, and I see it through history. Okay, what does that mean for us? Well, the first place I went to was Google, where I did a search for church growth strategies. And there are many, and they are terrible. In fact, one that I went to had 11 points about how to grow a church, guaranteed. And not once did the name of Jesus or the word gospel appear. Not once. I've said before, yeah, we could fill a building, but it wouldn't be full of converts. It would be a field full of tares. And it would be a lot of unleavened flour and lump. Jesus says something interesting to the disciples, again, vis-a-vis uh, -vis these parables at Luke 17, 1720. Make a note of it, because we may not ever get back to it. 1720 in Luke, being asked of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus answered, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, exclamation point. For behold, the kingdom of God, mark this very carefully, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Braden, what does that mean? Well, the kingdom of God is in, totally encapsulated in the person of Jesus Christ. He himself is the kingdom, standing in the midst of the unbelieving Pharisees. But more than that, if Christ embodies the kingdom, and he does so, what then of those who are in Christ. See? We are the kingdom. We are the leaven. We are sheltering in the branches of the mustard seed, now grown into something global. I wrote here, because I've said that sometimes I'm better with a pen than I am with my tongue. The kingdom cannot be thought of in terms of geography. It is not found in edifice or institutions. Rather, being a kingdom not of this world, it is found singularly in Christ, its king, and in the hearts, minds, and lives of his people with whom he has union. If the kingdom is embodied in Christ, then the kingdom must also 
be embodied in the people of Christ, the people who yearn after him, who have been redeemed by him, who have been made new creatures in him, who have his mind. And this leads us back to the quality of our ambassadorial task, our ambassadorship. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are ambassadors for Christ, and we are leaven, working in the flower of the world, leavening it. So what does this have to do for us here in our contemporary, current settings? Are you being leavened? Are you working your way through to bring in that Lucan language? Are you intentionally coming alongside non-believers, rubbing off on them, letting them see you, letting them see your good work so that they may come and glorify God? Are you inviting them to the barbecue on the 13th? Are you sacrificially, maybe out of your own means, giving to someone else who has even less than you? So they may see charity and say, where does this come from? Well, Christ has done so much more for me. This is the least I can do for you. I love you because he loves you as well. Are we, are we doing that? Because if we think of the kingdom in terms of cultural influence and we stop doing that, then you see it all falls apart. And now the morals are no longer rooted in biblical morals. And the standards are sliding away. No, it's incumbent on us, being at this stage in the growth of the mustard plant, to continue to dedicate ourselves to working through the lump and being leavened being ambassadors for the kingdom. That is an active verb. It's not passive. The world will never become affected by us just gathering on our worship services and staying inside the walls of the building and keeping our faith quiet and keeping the light under a bushel. The takeaway for us is that we must be active leaven out there, mixing rubbing shoulders, and affecting. Never compromising, yes, never changing the seed, never changing the way in which we cast that seed, but casting nevertheless, affecting nevertheless, so that we may be better ambassadors until the whole loaf is leavened. Now mark me, a day will come sooner than we think with trumpet blast and rolling back of the clouds, and then it will be time for all of this to end, which also should give us a sense of hastening. We have to do this while the time yet remains, and people need to hear the message while the time yet remains. And that should be part of our message, come while time yet remains. So what does this mean for us in our contemporary church setting? It means that Christ will build his church, that he will grow his kingdom according to his own sovereign plan and power, and that it is simply up to us. What part do we play in this? Go be leaven. Go be leaven. Let's pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and study your words, and we marvel at the depth of truth that is found in even a trio of verses. We thank you that your sovereign steady hand has been with the church and all its members throughout the sweep of history and as we enjoy our moment sheltering in the bush that giant herb that is the global physical presence of the church let us not neglect the invisible task that has been called to us to be the salt of the earth to be leaven affecting the whole loaf that all may be fed that all may be nourished let us not give in to a spirit of fear, but determination. Let us not be ashamed of who you are and who we are in you, but rather let us be proclaiming, always proclaiming, encouraging, even with tears. Come, taste, enjoy, be saved. Strengthen our evangelistic efforts, whether they are within the confines of our own home or across the street or across the nation. We pray all this in your name, for we can do nothing of our own. Amen.